Hello everyone, how are you all? Thank you so much for joining our today's session. So we are going to do cardiology role play today. Now, before we start that, you guys remember that we have lived with just one case for cardiology. So that was your CVS risk assessment, right? So we did the syncope cluster, we did the chest pain cluster, palpitation cluster. So have you guys prepared well already? Okay, so before we go for cardiology role play session, I'll just finish this one with you. So CVS risk assessment. So just one case that we need to talk about. So it's an important case. That's why it's a good idea to finish before you start role play. All right. So those who are in the Facebook, if you guys are having any questions about our class or anything that you don't understand, make sure you comment so that I can have a look and answer your queries. Okay. So in CVS risk assessment, usually the case that comes in the exam, usually it will be like someone had their father or the brother had a recent heart attack or recent coronary bypass surgery. Now, because most of the patient in Australia, they know about this familial condition that can run in the families like myocardial infarction and many other condition. So they will come to you asking for some help that my brother has been recently diagnosed with acute myocardial infarction and he has to have a coronary bypass operation two weeks ago. So I want to know that what's my risk and what I can do to prevent having the same thing just like my brother. So a, you are a GP, a middle-aged man came to have a consultation after his brother went for coronary bypass two weeks ago. He is obese, no other past medical history. Your task is to take a focused history, physical examination findings from the examiner and explain what will be the initial management. Okay, so... In history, always reassure the patient and appreciate the patient because he came to you to take advice. So it's very important to make a good rapport initially. So start in this way. Hi, John. This is Dr. Arshan, one of the doctor in here. It's very nice to meet you. I'm really sorry to know about your brother. How is your brother doing now? Is he fine? So always like if in the stem or during your conversation with the patient, they say something about their relatives that they are sick or they passed away recently, always say sorry, always ask how they are doing. It's a very, very important thing to do. Many of the candidates, they will just avoid that and they will think that these are unnecessary talking. No, it's not unnecessary. Patient wants reassurance from you. Okay, when they open up with you, you need to also show your sympathy towards the patient. So if this patient had a brother and brother just had a bypass operation, obviously he is stressed about it. So ask how your brother is doing. Is he doing fine now? Yes, doctor, thank you for asking. All right, John. So I really appreciate that you are here to discuss about it. Now, I want to ask a few questions to find out What's your risk of having similar kind of situation in the future? So that's how you start your question. Now, in case of CVS risk assessment, we follow the mnemonic A, B, C, D, E, F, S. Just remember that and you will, like, you will know what to ask for risk assessment to the patient. Now that include A for alcohol intake, if someone says that, doctor, I drink like um, six glasses of wines every day. So obviously it's more than two standard drink. So always say that, John, if you give me the consent, I would like to talk in detail about the alcohol counseling. 
in our next appointment. Okay, so of, offer another appointment regarding alcohol cessation if you think that this patient is consuming more than what is a standard. Okay, so that's always important. Just immediately do that so that you don't forget during your management. Same goes with the smoking as well. Now, A is for alcohol, B for blood pressure and body weight or BMI. So you can ask the patient that if, do you know like what's your body weight or what's your BMI? You can ask it to the patient, that's fine. C for cholesterol level, or you can ask to the patient that do you have any history of increased cholesterol? D for diabetes, very important history to ask and also dietary history. E for exercise. F for family history of diabetes, high blood pressure or any kind of heart disease. So it's family history. S for smoking, another is for stress. And lastly, you just need to ask about any past medical or surgical history, any medication this patient is taking or not. So that's your history mainly, okay? Sometimes you can ask a little bit more about just a general medical condition, like how, like, can you please tell me more? Like, I need to ask a few questions regarding it. Then you can ask like, John, how are you doing these days? Do you think that you are feeling all right? Or do you have any particular symptoms like chest pain, difficulty breathing, any pain in your leg, any problem with your vision? So anything that you are concerned about. So you can start your question in that way also, just to find out how the patient is doing. Does the patient have any severe symptoms or not? So you're gonna start with the symptoms followed by ABCD EFS. That's a little good. Otherwise, if you just start asking your question with alcohol, that doesn't like, doesn't seem very good, okay? So start with the symptoms followed by you start asking all the ABCD EFS. So you can actually write ABCD EFS in your paper in front so that you don't forget asking about it. So ask about, so John, do you drink alcohol? Yes. Do you smoke? Yes. How, so how many cigarettes per day? How many drinks per day? Okay. So alcohol and smoke, you can ask together. Then ask about, do you have any history of increased blood pressure? How's your body weight? Do you know your BMI? Any history of increased cholesterol? Any history of diabetes? Can you describe your typical daily diet to me? Do you do any kind of exercise? Any stress at your work? Any stress at your home? Any financial issues? Any family history of diabetes, high blood pressure, or heart disease? Okay. Do you have any other medical or surgical history? Are you on any kind of medication? So that's how you will just ask your history. So your history is not too much bigger, but it should contain all the ABCD EFS. After that, Hang the patient. Now you need to ask some of the physical examination. In case this is the online examination, like now how they're doing, most of the PEFE will be on card, but it's still we don't know that every PEFE will be on card or not. So still we will go with learning how to ask physical examination from examiner. So they can sometimes ask it that you, you need to ask physical examination from the examiner apart from just giving it on card. So it's important to still learning that because it's very, very important for one of the tasks in the exam. Now, in case of physical examination from invigilator or examiner, start with the general appearance. Now, you will follow the same physical examination that you used to follow in the CVS. We just have only one CVS format, right? As per our previous two classes. You will follow that, but add something more related to the CVS risk assessment. Like in the general appearance, you need to ask about 
any sign of high cholesterol like any gentle asthma, any xanthoma, any corneal argus. Ask about pickled, mainly in here, pallor, icterus, clubbing, dehydration, you can ask. Ask about vitals and BMI. So vital is very important to know about the blood pressure. BMI is also very important because that will indicate obesity. So these are very, very important. Ask general CVS examination, respiratory, abdomen, and finish with urine dipstick, BSL, and ECG. Blood sugar is important. Now, once you are finished with that, ask the examiner or invigilator that, dear invigilator, is there any cardiovascular risk assessment chart available or not? So it's called CVS risk assessment chart. I guess all of you have seen that because all of you has passed MCQ already. So you used to have that question, right? Like CVS risk assessment is the same chart. Now in here, most of the time it will not be available. So if the examiner says it's not available, proceed with the task, then you don't bother with that. But sometimes they can provide it to you. Then you need to know how to how to manage those situations. We will discuss that. So whatever positive findings you will get from your history, you have to address those issues, okay? So let's say that this patient having high blood pressure, having increased body weight, having history of diabetes, poor dietary habit, also smoker, okay? So in that case, you will say in this way, so John, from your history and physical examination, I have found some of the risk factors that can put you in having a heart attack in the next five years, such as you are having high blood pressure, your body weight is higher than normal, you have diabetes, and your diet contains fatty food rather than healthy balanced food. On the top of that, you have been smoking for 20 years. All of this can put you on some of the risk for having a heart-related complication in future. In here, you can say, no, I, I could not assess the absolute risk of you in the next five years. So what I would do, I would fill a five yearly CVS risk assessment chart for you. And we will see that if you are in the low average or high risk to have a cardiovascular or heart related complication in the next five years time. So you can just say that you are going to do that because you don't have the chart at the moment, but you are going to do that and you will say that what is the risk of this patient depending on that chart. So just use that line. And then say, please don't worry. Still, we have a lot of time to prevent this complication by adopting healthy lifestyle. So I would advise you to cut down your alcohol to the safe drinking level we will discuss it in detail in our next session. Also, try to maintain ideal body weight, avoid smoking, take healthy balanced diet, do some exercise, ideally 30 minutes of walking on most of the days of your week, and also try to avoid stressful works. So this is SNAP, which means just lifestyle modification, same in everywhere. Also, I would like to arrange some investigations like your full blood examination, your kidney function, ECG, blood sugar level, and a lipid profile. So it depends that if you get blood sugar level in the office test, ECG in the office test, then you don't need to order it. But most of the time, examiner will say it's unavailable. So you need to do a formal blood test to see the blood sugar level, to see the ECG, kidney function, and also the lipid profile, okay? And lastly, finish with four hours. So say that I'm going to review you again once these results are back. And then using those results, I will make a five-yearly cardiovascular risk assessment with you in our next appointment, okay? The referral is not needed. You can give a reading material to the patient and you can give some red flag as well. So in case you have chest pain that starts in your left 
and goes to your arm, neck and jaw to feel nauseous, vomiting or excessively sweating or having a shortness of breath, please come back to me or go to the emergency department immediately. Okay, so that's how you will finish this case. Not very hard, it's very easy case to pass, but you need to know what you are looking for. Okay, now there is another case, GP middle-aged 57 years old, came for follow-up. Recently, his brother passed away from heart attack two weeks ago. He is a smoker. There is no other past medical history. These are the, some of the blood investigations results for these patients. So you have got your blood blood pressure 160 by 100. Full blood count unremarkable. Lipid profile shows cholesterol HDL ratio eight is to one. Now, those of you know how, how to do the cardiovascular risk assessment, you know that for cardiovascular risk assessment, you will need to know if this patient is a smoker or not, if this patient diabetic or not, what is the age of this patient, what is the gender of this patient, what is the systolic blood pressure of this patient, and what is the cholesterol and HDL ratio of this patient. So that is mainly what you need to know to estimate the cardiovascular risk. Your task is to estimate cardiovascular risk and then explain it to the patient and further management. Okay, now this one, don't get stressed about it. It's not very hard. You already did it in your MCQ. For those of you who are still having some confusion, make sure that you, know, you are all good with this chart after today's session. So if you look at here, so you can see people without diabetes. This is the chart for them. In here, there is men and women. So our patient is a man, okay? Now, there is some of the age you can see here. What's the age of our patient? 57. So 57 will be in this age group, right? So we are, we are looking for this chart mainly. After that, you can see there is non-smoker, smoker. Is our patient a smoker? He's a smoker. So now we know that we are mainly looking for this part. Then in this chart, you can see on the y-axis, there is systolic blood pressure, right? So that's your systolic blood pressure, 120, 140, 160, 179. And in the x-axis, you can see cholesterol and HDL ratio, which is four, six, four, five, six, seven, eight. So you need to know this value of these two things. What is the systolic blood pressure of our patient? 160. So where 160 will be in this chart? So 120, 140, 160. So this chart is 160 chart. So we're looking for mainly this area, right? And what's the cholesterol HDL ratio? Mainly you need to know the cholesterol. So cholesterol is eight. So for a cholesterol of eight, you can see this is the eight, right? So you go up, up, up. So now you can see this patient actually falls in the red zone, right? So if you find out this spot, then you just need to see what red color means. So in here, you can see this is the risk given. According to this color, red means more than 30% risk, which means this patient is high risk of having a serious related complication in the next five year time. Is this all good? Now the question which becomes more complicated is, what, what is the highest limit of these lines? Remember one thing, this 120, 140, these are not the highest limit of these boxes. Now, if you look at the lowest box, 
the lowest box, the highest limit of this box is 130. So 10 of what is written in here. So at 10, so 120, that means 130. So 130 is the highest limit of this box. For the second one is 150, then 170. Okay, so in this way. So the next question is, if someone's systolic blood pressure is 125, that patient's, where that patient's box will be? In the, in the lowest, that means in the first or in the second? So if someone's systolic blood pressure is 125, where do you think this patient will be? So yellow box, that's right. So that's good. So in the in the lowest box, right? What if someone's systolic blood pressure is 130? Now, when it becomes marginal, the rule is to go to the go to the next box. So if it is 130, which means marginal, you will you will take the next box. Someone's is 150, so it will be in the next box. Okay, so in case of marginal, you will move upward. Cool. So that's very important to understand. Now let's say, what about this cholesterol thing? What is the highest limit of these boxes? Not four, so it's 4.5. So 4.5 is the highest limit of this first box. Then 5.5, 6.5, 7.5, 8.5. So if someone's cholesterol level is 6.3, so 6.3 will fall in here. Same with that, if it is 6.5, you will go to the next box. So always if marginal, you go to the next box. Is this clear for everyone? Any question? Now, relative risk usually not very important. Okay, so do they ask relative risk? Because relative risk, I haven't seen like it's important for the exam. So it's like absolute risk is mainly what is the probability of someone having a heart-related complication in the next five years. Now, relative risk means that someone having a specific risk factor in, rel in relation to that specific risk factor, what is the chance that this patient is going to have heart-related complication in the next five years? Like someone having diabetes, so that's the specific risk factor this patient is having. Relative risk means that what is the probability of this patient to have heart-related complication in relationship to diabetes? So it's a more specific thing. It's not very important. 
So mainly if they ask, they will ask you this chart, absolute risk assessment, because this is more commonly used in Australia. No, absolute risk assessment only have these things in, in their assessment. Someone having already having any, like, let's say someone having angina or someone having myocardial infarction history before, you don't need to do risk assessment for them. They are already high risk. Okay, if this left ventricular hypertrophy happens as a complication of any heart-related condition, let's say that this patient had a MI before and now developed LVAs, they are already high risk. You don't need to do absolute risk assessment for them. This is mainly for those patients who are not having any heart condition now or, or doesn't seem to be having any history of myocardial infarction, angina, or anything. Okay. So what if patient is diabetic? So if patient is diabetic, then there will be another chart. We have to use the other chart. Is this clear, Dr. Uh, Lin? about the absolute versus relative risk. And Dr. Robin, I think you know now that what you will do if cholesterol is 7.5. They don't ask components, Dr. Parala, so don't worry on the components. Pickled, good. Yes, we always ask this in physical examination. You don't need to ask everything, just the relevant one. Cool. Any question? Those who are in the Facebook, do you guys have any question? Let's see. So now we are going to do the role play. Who wants to do the first role play? Dr. Sadov, Dr. Patnia, Dr. Tasnia. So let's start with Dr. Tasnia first because I can see her name first. All right, I will unmute you, Dr. Tasnia. And I will stop sharing for just a moment. Dr. Tasnia, can you hear Hello. me? Hello, yes. Okay. All right. Just give me one minute. I'll open the other okay. one. So for any role play session, usually in the exam, you will get two minute outside and eight minute inside. But okay. during your role play session with me or any of your study partners, always cut short your time. So I'll give one minute time for your outside and seven minute inside. Okay. 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 okay so this is your case. Your one minute time just started.
if you want to see the ECG, let me know. Can I see now or when I start then? You can see now. Thank you. All right, doctor. So this is your patient. Your patient's wife is here. The wife name is Sarah. You can start. Hello, Sarah. How are you today? I'm Dr. Pasnia. I'm going to take care of your husband today. Yes, doctor. My, I don't know what's happened to my husband. He was just complaining of chest pain and I just brought him as soon as possible. Is he going to be all right, doctor? Uh, I'm sorry to hear that, Sarah, but let me assure you, your husband is in best possible hand. So we will try our best to help you. Is that okay, Sarah? Yes, doctor. Thank you. Uh, uh, may I know, do you have the consent from your um, husband to um, yes, discuss yes. this? Okay, thank you. Um, Sarah, Sarah, can you please tell me uh, what exactly happened today? So, so Peter was actually just doing gardening at that time. And suddenly just, he, he was just like putting his hand on the left side of his chest. And I thought, what's going on? And I went to him and he says that he's having like chest pain. So that's why I just brought him here. Okay, uh, now, uh, now he's in uh, ICU at the moment or? Yes. Okay, uh, thank you, Sarah. Okay, uh, now can you please tell me uh, how long he's uh, having this chest pain? So this is started just uh, in the morning. Okay. Is it for the first time? Yes, doctor. Uh, is it continuous or on and off? I'm not sure, doctor. Okay. Um, can you please tell me, is there any associated shortness of breath? Yeah, he was complaining of shortness of breath at that time. Okay, and uh, is he having shortness of breath at night as well? Uh, I haven't heard about it before. Okay, uh, is there any other symptoms like racing of heart or cough or fever? Mm, no. Okay. Uh, okay, Sarah, uh, can you please tell me if there are any, um, anything like uh, about his smoking or alcohol history, anything like that? Yes, uh, so he's been smoking for a long time. I think it's, it's been since his uh, teenage. So he mm -hmm. smoked like about 15 cigarettes every day. Okay, and is he in any kind of medication? No. Okay. And uh, is he having any disease like from before? Mm, not that I know. Okay. Okay. Uh, do you have any family history of uh, any heart disease or any sudden death? His brother had heart heart attack, I think. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Sarah, for your history. Um, uh, let me go to my examiner first, and then I will come back to you as soon as possible. Okay, Sarah. Hello, examiner. Uh, can I see the ECG again, please? Yes. Uh, may I confirm that uh, it is the ECG of uh, my patient's ECG? Yes, this is uh, Peter's ECG. Okay. Okay. Thank you, examiner. Um, uh, this is a 12 lead ECG of my patient, Peter, who came with sudden cardiac chest pain for 30 minutes. And in this ECG, I can see that uh, there are still elevations in anterior leads and um, uh, rate, is, uh, uh, rate is 75 beat per minute and rhythm is regular and acute interval is normal. So I'm suspecting uh, my patient is having 
anterior myocardial infection uh, infarction at the moment. Okay. Uh, can I go to my patient now? Yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, Sarah, uh, from your history and um, ECG examination finding, I'm suspecting your uh, husband is having uh, anterior myocardial infarction. Uh, excuse me for the medical jargon. It's actu actu uh, actually a heart attack he's having at the moment. Are you getting me, Sarah? Now, how these things happened, I, I can't understand. He was totally healthy before that. Yeah, oh I'm, God, I'm he, very sorry to say. Is he going to be okay? Yes, Sarah, let me assure you, as uh, he's in best possible hand, we will try our best to help you. Okay, Sarah? Yeah. Yes, yeah, so as he is in hospital, uh, we'll try uh, try to do, um, I, I'm going to refer as soon as possible to see the cardiologist. And once cardiologist review him, he will um, refer for angiogram. And according to the angiogram result, we will do the percutaneous inter intervention. Actually, it's the stenting of artery. So it will keep the artery open. And after the ballooning, if necessary, then cardiologist will suggest for open heart surgery if need, needed. Are you getting me, Sarah? Yeah. Okay. And uh, once he discharged from hospital, I will uh, keep him in regular follow-up. And uh, please uh, ask him for lifestyle modifications, like uh, reduce alcohol intake and smoking, and try to do a healthy diet and um, regular exercise. And if you uh, see anything like this, any shortness of breath or any chest pain like this, please come back and see me as soon as possible. Okay, Sarah? Yeah. Okay. And uh, do you have any more question to me? No, doctor, thank you. Thank you. All right, so did you finish? Uh, yes, I'm feeling very nervous. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I can see that. But that's totally, that's totally fine, Dr. Tasnia. You just passed your MCQ and now I think like you just recently passed in November, right? October. October. That's fine. And you started our course just recently. So it's okay. You you were like a novice and you were amateur, but you, you're doing good. Don't worry on that. It will take some time to get that, that confidence in your tone and everything. But you are asking relevant questions, doing all the necessary things. That's all that matters. Don't worry on that. You will be fine. Do more, more and more role play. Follow our course notes also, and then you will find that you are you, you are in the track. You just need more and more role play, and you'll be fine. Don't worry. You did good. Now tell me a little bit that did you say anterior MI or inferior MI? I anterior. Not anterior. Good. And what was the management you did? Um, percutaneous intervention. You can't do the percutaneous intervention in here because your nearest hospital is four hours away. Okay, so I have to transfer. Because, okay. And you don't have any option to transfer also. So the question is, see that question is very clear that whatever you are thinking, they know that you want to send this patient to the hospital or at least want to transfer this patient to a tertiary one, but you don't have that option. So what you can do at this time for this patient. So that's the main, okay. main thing that they are going to ask. So mainly you have to talk about Mona in here. So you have to give morphine. Oh, yes, I forgot totally that resuscitation can yeah. Be yeah, that's very important. And also there is no option of PCI given the situation this patient is in because this patient's nearest, nearest hospital four hours away. So we have to go for thrombolysis in here. Nothing we can do about PCI. You can always talk about it, that PCI is an option for this patient, but because the nearest hospital four hours away, every minute we are waiting for that, this patient is actually losing some part of their heart muscle. So we can't do that. And also because this patient will need thrombolysis, you will not, like you have to rule out some of the contraindications for doing thrombolysis. What are the main absolute like contraindications? So in the past medical history, that's why they have given you the chance to talk with the wife. So mainly you need to rule that out. So 
main <laughs> main contraindication that if this patient had any previous history of a stroke so it could be ischemic stroke but more importantly any hemorrhagic stroke you need to find out any recent head injury any history of any bleeding disorders or if this patient is on any blood thinners you need to find out any recent surgery any history of brain tumor okay so mainly these are the things that you need to find out so any previous history of any intracranial hemorrhage any previous history of a stroke especially in the previous 3 months time any history of known brain tumor any history of surgery recently head injury any bleeding disorder or blood thinners so in these cases you cannot go for thrombolysis you you can sometimes but you have to talk with the cardiologist before you proceed for thrombolysis so this case is mainly your key steps in the history will be so how you are approaching this case that matters because in here they have given you the ecg and by looking at the ecg you already understand this is a case of anterior mi so in case of anterior mi you cannot wait for anything okay so what you need to do you need to ask the so you what you how you started is good so you you greet with the wife you ask for consent mainly because this is very important thing that you have done very good that do you have the consent to discuss about your patient so it's always important to do that in australia this matters it's really very important that you ask for it now you can ask ask it to the examiner or you can directly ask to the patient or, or wife mainly in here that's fine okay you don't need to go to the invigilator or examiner for this sort of question you can ask directly to the wife or any other relative after that in this case you have to start with greeting followed by consent to discuss about the patient third thing will be give some reassurance to the wife as you did fourth thing will be you need to go to the invigilator ask the invigilator how is the vitals of my patient it's very important because this patient having acute mi we we need to make sure that what's the vital so vitals is very important next whatever is the vital even if it is stable you need to send this patient to the treatment room or resuscitation bay and you have to follow the same thing that we discussed in our last class so and mm -hmm. I, i want to send my patient to the treatment room and then in um, already the ecg has been done so you don't need to order ecg you need to insert two white bore iv cannula take the blood for necessary investigation including the cardiac enzymes and troponin okay yeah mainly the troponin and then what you need to do that you want to start mona immediately to this patient you don't need to wait for history to start mona so you will say i'm going to i'm going to start morphine for the chest pain okay mm -hmm. if in the vital oxygen is good that means more than 94 you don't need to start oxygen in for nitrate nitrate is not very very important you can wait for giving nitrate but you should start aspirin if it is not given so you you want to aspirin 300 mg loading dose to this patient making sure this patient doesn't have any history of bleeding peptic ulcer as my patient is not here do i need to still ask for vitals because yes. patient is not here yeah it's whatever it is like patient now in here they haven't actually said where is the patient so you don't if you are if you're not sure don't ask it to the patient like i think like you asked that is he in the icu yes now it's your job to know that where is the patient it's not the relatives job to know where is the patient now right so mm -hmm. don't ask this question assume that this patient is ma mainly this sort of patient goes to the 
emergency department or it could be in your clinic also okay so this patient needs to have aspirin needs to have all the mona initially because already ecg has been given so you don't need to wait for asking ecg from the examiner and then explaining okay so if ecg is outside and you already seeing that this patient having acute mi you cannot wait okay so you you need to you need to act very promptly in this case after you have done that then you ask a little bit of history from the wife so you don't need to worry a lot about history you can just ask about how this is started when did it started now important to know the exact time so you need to dig it out if if the if the wife is not sure it still get a little approximate idea when this is started because this will help with the management okay okay yeah. so ask that can you please tell me a little bit more about the chest pain what exactly happened today and when exactly did it start it i really need to know for the purpose of the management yeah. okay so the duration of time because if it is more than 12 hours this patient having chest pain then there is no indication of doing anything apart from symptomatic management so that duration is important and then just ask about the chest pain associated mainly in here you can ask about did he have any nausea vomiting excessive sweating any difficulty breathing any racing of the heart any previous history of heart attack or angina, very important. Any previous history of this type of chest pain. And then you can just, just ask about some of the other th risk factor like any history of diabetes, high blood pressure, smoking, drinking, past medical or surgical history, family history. So in this, and also ask the contraindications for doing a thrombolysis. So in specifically ask, and does he have any bleeding disorder? Is he on any kind of blood thinner? Any recent history of surgery or head injury? Any recent history of a stroke or any previous history of bleeding in the brain? So specifically ask so that examiner knows that what you are asking and they will be really happy with your approach. Okay, now not every Socrates question will be needed in here, Dr. Sadaf, because wife may not know what is the level of chest pain this patient having. So you don't need to ask that, how are you going to score the pain for, for him? So asking pain score from another person is not very important because they will not know. Okay, so you can just like avoid that question. You can, you, and even like anything makes it better, anything makes it worse, not important. Radiation is important. Associated symptom is important. Onset is important. So important thing you will ask. Okay. okay. So that's your history. And then you explain ECG to the examiner. So just like you did, you will start with the rate, freedom, and everything you will say. In here, where are the ST elevation we can see? You can see the ST elevation in mainly V1 is not prominent, but V2, V3, V4, mainly these are very prominent. Also mm -hmm. something in the V6, mm -hmm. okay? But if you just say V2, V3, V4, that should be fine. Mm -hmm. And also I can see that lead one having how you know that this is called J point. If you look at here, this is the J point, okay? So okay. this lead one, lead AVL also having kind of a stay elevation. Yeah. All right. So this is the anterolateral MI mainly. So anterolateral MI, you can diagnose it. If you are not sure what type of MI it is, just say it's myocardial infarction or a heart attack. That's okay. fine. You don't need to specify the type of MI. Okay. All right. Now, this feedback was like this. You can give it a read from our notes that how was the feedback. But everything that we have discussed, it covers all. In the management, Mona is must. You can also explain the management with the wife because you're one of the important tasks is to explain management to the wife. So you can say 
that I already have done this thing. So I have, I have given morphine as a pain reliever. If oxygen saturation comes below 94 or below normal, then we will also start him with oxygen, which will help, in, help him to breathe better. In case he's having more chest pain, we can also start him with nitroglycerin or glyceryl trinitrate that can also help his heart to relax. Also, I have given aspirin, which will help making the blood to be thinner and to prevent further clot formation. Okay, now this Mona is not first, you have to explain what happened. So you can say that, Sarah, I'm really sorry to say, given your history and looking at the electrocardiogram, I'm suspecting your husband is having myocardial infarction or heart attack. I'm really sorry. Give a pause, see what's their patient's react, what's the wife reaction. Sometimes they can say, oh, how can it happen? I'm, I don't know what I'm going to do. So whatever their reaction, you act on that. If they start crying, you offer tissue and water. Now in the online, how are you going to do that? You can just say that, well, I'm going to offer you some, uh, I'm, uh, you can say, Sarah, I, am, I can't even imagine how you're feeling right now. Please take this, please take a tissue and water. So you can just say, okay, in, in online, it's all that how you say, you have to cover everything just like you would do in the face-to-face. -face. In here, you just need to say that, well, Sarah, you can just please take the tissue and water in front of you. I'm really sorry. So that way you will cover that part also. After that, you have to explain what is heart attack or what is myocardial infarction. So draw the heart, draw the blood vessels, say that this is heart and just like all other body part, heart has also blood pipes, which supplies blood to it. In your husband's case, most likely there is a block in one or multiple blood pipes that used to supply, supply the blood. By looking at the electrocardiogram, I can see that most likely your, your husband is suffering or most likely your husband has got a heart attack in his front part of the heart. Please don't get stressed. You did the right job bringing him here as soon as possible. And we have started the most important management as soon as we have seen that he's having a heart attack. The next management is very important. Most of these heart attack patients used, usually get percutaneous coronary intervention but I'm really sorry that we are in a rural clinic and the nearest hospital is about four hours away and we don't have the time to send him to the hospital which can provide this coronary intervention. The next option that we are having is called thrombolysis, which means that we are going to give a medication which will help to dissolve the clot that's blocking your husband's heart blood pipes. But I need you to know that there are some risks associated with this thrombolysis as well. And also, I made sure that your husband doesn't have any contraindications to get this, to get this type of management. Okay, so just you need to just mainly talk about what is thrombolysis, what is monotherapy, and you, you have already sent for appropriate investigations you need to also involve the cardiologist before you go for thrombolysis. It's very important. You cannot just start thrombolysis for everyone. You, you, you have phone with you. So you have to talk with the nearest hospital that you are sending this patient after thrombolysis. So talk with the cardiologist, discuss about what's happening. And then if the cardiologist is happy, you will go for thrombolysis. Once thrombolysis is done you will observe the patient for few hours and then send the patient to the hospital okay so that should be your management in here what if patient ask 
if thrombolysis is as effective as PCI. Okay. Now, the thing is like, you have to be very logical with the patient in this sort of situation. You have to say that, I really appreciate your question, John. Parcutaneous coronary intervention is the most standard method of treatment for your husband condition in which we can remove the clot and sometimes we can put a stent or balloon to open up the blood pipes. But given the situation, we don't have that option with us. And if we wait for four hours to send you to the nearest hospital, that can be life-threatening for your husband. So we should not go for this option. The next best option that we are having is the thrombolysis. Now, it may not be as effective as the coronary intervention, but this is one of the best possible options that we are having at this time. So you have to be logical with the patient. Obviously, PCI is best. That's why we prefer that, right? And also the side effect of PCI is less rather than thrombolysis. Patient with thrombolysis can go into cardiogenic shock, can have a start, can, can start bleeding also. So there are risks with thrombolysis, but what is best for this patient, that matters. Now, if, there, if any of the time there is contraindication of thrombolysis is there, you have to discuss it with the cardiologist, see that what's the option available for this patient. At that time, you cannot decide any particular thing for this patient. You, you have to say, now your husband had a history of a stroke three months ago. This is a contraindication to have the thrombolysis. So I need to discuss with the heart specialist for the best possible options for him. Okay, cool, guys, any question? I'm going to just uh, mute you, Dr. Tasnia. You did good, thank you. Yes, in rural hospital, Dr. Robin, we can do thrombolysis. But before doing thrombolysis, we have to consult with the specialist. So you have to just say, I'm going to talk with the cardiologist from the hospital. After discussing with the cardiologist, if he agrees, then we are going to proceed with the thrombolysis. Now, if, if don't look at the lead two, three, these are not actually uh, bundle branch block. In case of bundle branch block, if it was there, this patient would also have bundle branch like M, -M, -M pattern or W pattern in these leads, like V1 to V6. In case it's not evident, you don't need to talk about bundle branch block in this patient. That's a good question, actually, Dr. Shaheda. You can say in, in here, if you want to, like you have to discuss the QRS, you can say M pattern QRS complex. That's fine. So you can say like, dear invigilator, I'm going to explain the 12 lead ECG of my patient, Peter, who presented with a sudden cardiac chest pain. Okay. According to the ECG, heart rate is is the heart rate one two three four five so like you can say about 50 per minute and 
rhythm is regular, P wave is normal, M, M pattern QR is complex, ST elevation in lead V2, V3, V4, and lead one and lead AVL. T wave is normal in size and shape, and there is no QT prolongation or QT interval is normal. You don't need to basically say about bundle branch block in this patient, you can just say this patient having anterolateral MI, myocardial infarction. Cool. Any question? Which one to explain, uh, repeat, Dr. Aisha? So uh, someone in the Facebooks asked, we need to ask for contraindication to GTN. Mm, not very important. Obviously, you are asking to the wife that is he on any kind of medication. So that's that will cover sildenafil for GTN. Also, you are asking vitals. If there is hypotension, you are not going to give GTN. So this two is the main complete main contraindication which you are already asking. So you don't need to bother with that. Dose of morphine or any medication is not very important. Dr. Gina, forget about dose, don't bother. Do we explain management to wife? Yes. When we talk about medication, if we talk to wife, there is no need to explain Mona detail. Yes, you should explain Mona to the wife as well because this is a part of management. You always, your management should be discussed with the patients or their relative, not with the examiner. Unless it is given in your task. After thrombolysis, usually we send the patient to a tertiary hospital. Okay. Yes, in, if it is an inferior MI, we don't go for GTM, that's right. In one AVL, this seems more towards ST elevation because if you go for here, this is the isoelectric line. Where is the ST wave? This is the J point. Now it's not totally evident, but in this one, in one, this is evident that this is the J point in here. Better to talk about ST elevation in here, but this one is totally M pattern, you can see. Okay, mainly in the lead two. How much history we will take from patient before asking vitals from invigilator? I think we just discussed about the step-by-step -step approach, right? Like how you're going to start your history in this case. So you have to just follow that. So greet yourself with the patient or wife, ask for consent that if, if she has the consent to talk about the husband. After that, reassure the wife that your husband is at the safe and he's going to be fine please don't worry you did the right thing so blah 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 and after that you go to the examiner for asking vitals in this case once you have done your immediate like immediate management that i discussed then you go for history Usually, explanation of the ECG should be after history. Okay, Dr. Lin. And 
if someone having chest pain, ECG has not been given, and it's an elderly patient, you have to ask, you have to say that you're going to send the patient to the treatment room, ask the nurse to have the ECG. So those things you will have to do first. Cool. Let's move. Okay. I know you guys are having a lot of questions and it's good that you are asking questions because now you know that what's the problem happening. Now you know that why you are lacking of. So it's good that you are asking questions. I'm more than happy to answer any questions. Okay. Even if it is like repeated multiple times, that's totally fine. Feel free to ask any question. Okay. Let's move then. Who wants to do the next one? All right, Dr. Dr. Padma Nishan. And then we will ask about, then we'll do with Vesna. All right. So let's start with Dr. Padma Nishan. And yes, that's right. Actually, we did discuss everything. Just what I'm discussing now, it's already been discussed in that class. We did theory class. So make sure you go through that theory session because most of the questions that you guys are asking, that's already been covered. So it will be more better if we do more role play. Okay, then you guys will understand what exactly you guys are lacking and what you need to improve. So Dr. Padma Nishan, I'm unmuting you. Yep, so you, know if you, you can, can hear me, Dr. Shan. Yes, good. All right, just give me one minute. I'll give you the case. I'll stop sharing for the moment. So how are you, Dr. Padmanishan? Yeah, good, uh, doctor. I've just joined your course. So hopefully. Yeah. 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 Well, don't worry. You are doing the good thing. And just <laughs> see you. that how we are doing the cages. Yes. Yep. How, for, like, try to follow all the clusters. And you will find that you, you, you will be getting better. OK? Yeah. Yep. And in Thank case you. you're feeling any trouble, always feel free to ask us in, in the classes or even through our email. Our team members will always be there to help. Sure. Thank you. Okay. So let's see. So you're ready. So you will get one minute outside yep. and seven minutes inside. Sure. So this is your case, your one minute time just. Okay. All right. Hi, doctor. So this is your patient's. Your yep. patient name is Jenny. You can start. All right. Hi, Jenny. My name is uh, Dr. Padma. I'm one of the doctors here. Um, uh, how are you feeling today? I'm, I'm feeling okay now, but doctor, I had this strange strange sensation in my heart 
I think it was like like fluttering and racing of my heart. And I was I was having lightheadedness at that time as well. So I, I don't know what's happening with me. I think something is wrong. I'm sorry to hear about this, Jenny. Uh, before I proceed, Jenny, I would um, like to check uh, about your hemodynamic stability. Uh, I'm going to go check on the examiner and ask, some, ask him some few questions. Is that okay with you? Yes. Uh, dear examiner, is my patient hemodynamically stable? Yes, go for it. Okay, thank you. Uh, hi, Jenny, I'm back. Um, uh, Jenny, I would like to uh, ask a few questions. Can you just elaborate a little bit more on your uh, uh, problem? Can you tell me when did it start? Yes, doctor. It, it started in the morning when I was uh, just like walking in the street and doing some exercise. I do it every day, but just today in the morning, I've, I've started feeling that strange sensation. Okay. And is it for the first time, Jenny? Is this happening or? No, apparently it's, it's my third time this week I'm having the same sensation. So, okay. yeah. And how does your, uh, is anything uh, making your palpitation uh, worse or uh, better? No, nothing. Okay. And um, um, are there any uh, associated features uh, along with your uh, palpitation? Do you have... Uh, chest pain, sharpness of breath, or uh, nausea or vomiting? No. Okay. And uh, do you have any um, um, uh, hearing problems, uh, uh, problems with your uh, uh, speech or headache with your, uh, when, when, when this happens? No. Are you uh, feeling excessively hot or cold um, um, or a change in bowel habits or body weight? Not really. Okay. And do you have any episodic um, uh, uh, flushing or uh, sweating? No. Okay. And um, uh, did you um, skip your uh, meal today, uh, Jenny? No, doctor. Okay. And do you feel, uh, uh, do you have any like uh, fever or cough today? No. Okay. And um, uh, do you feel tired? Uh, these days? No. Okay. And um, um, uh, do you uh, consume a lot of uh, tea or coffee? Uh, I, used, I used to like drink a coffee like about four or five cups a day. Oh, five cups a day. Okay. All right. That's great. And um, do you have like any other uh, uh, past medical history like diabetes or hypertension or uh, heart disease? Pressure. You have high blood pressure, that's great. And do you take any medications for that? Yes, I think I take uh, one of the medication called uh, Remipril. Okay, that's good to know. And uh, do you have any family history of uh, heart disease or hypertension or anything? No. Okay. And how's your uh, um, uh, work life? Uh, do you have uh, stress at uh, your uh, work or at home? I don't do any work nowadays, doctor, but uh, yeah, I'm, I'm happy at my home. Okay, all right. And um, when was your, uh, 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 is your uh, periods regular? Yes. Okay, all right. Um, uh, thank you, Jenny, for the uh, questions. I would like to go back to the examiner and uh, get some uh, more details. Is that okay with you? Yes. All right. Uh, dear examiner, can you give some uh, uh, details on the physical examination, including the so, vitals? And, yep. Yes. So the PFE card shows that patient's is blood pressure is 110 by 70, heart okay. rate is 120. Okay. And oxygen saturation is 95, temperature okay. is 37, and All respiratory right. rate is 24. Okay. All and other cardiovascular system is normal examination. Okay. All other systems are normal. All right. And uh, any office tests do you have for this patient? What, what do you want to know? Like ECG or uh, blood sugar or yes. urine dipstick? Blood sugar urine is not available, but you have got ECG. Okay. All right.
Okay. You are running out of time. You want to explain? Okay. All right. So, um, um, can I uh, talk to the patient? Yep. All right. Um, hi, Jenny. I have uh, um, reviewed your uh, um, uh, history and uh, uh, did some examination and also reviewed your um, um, uh, ECG. Um, um, should would I would you like me to explain your diagnosis uh, and the um, uh, the implication? Yes. Is it okay? Yes. All right. Um, uh, this I is. Uh, it's okay. Yep. So, all right, Doctor Padma, you did really good. But what happened with the ECG? So tell me what the ECG is about. Okay. So the. Um, I was a bit confused between AFib and SVT, but I think I would uh, still go with SVT uh, with this uh, ECG because okay. in the lower lead, uh, the rhythm uh, looks regular for me, that lead two. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it's still regular for me. Um, so I, I would say it's uh, SVT. Uh, with a very high heart rate, maybe one approximately 150 per minute, uh, regular rhythm with uh, maybe absent uh, P waves, narrow complex QRS, uh, no ST, and uh, um, T wave is normal in shape and QT is uh, normal interval. Okay. Now, yep. the thing is, Dr. Padma, in here, if you look very closely to the to this thing, then you'll find out in somewhere it's not regular actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I understand the confusion. It's a little confusing, obviously, but if you just give it a try here, so see this one. So yeah. one, two, so two and a half large square in between this RR interval. Yep. And if you see here. Let's say here, in here it's just one, one and a half, right? Yeah. Yep. This part. So obviously like this one is not regular. This yeah. is irregular. If you look at here, you can see that there is some like, you cannot appreciate any specific P wave. These are all mm. fibrillatory waves. Yes. True. Although it's hard, I know the ECGs are really hard to yep. get, but if you just have a look that rhythms are irregular, yep. most likely it's atrial fibrillation then you can just make up your mind that, well, heart rate is, you can say that you, you cannot actually say what is the heart rate by looking at it. You can say, but you don't have that much time. So just don't bother with what is the heart rate. Just say it, there is tachycardia, mm -hmm. then rhythm is irregular, absence of P wave, mm -hmm. uh, and also like which is replaced by fibrillatory F waves, narrow complex tachycardia or narrow QRS complex, Yep. ST, there is no ST wave changes. T wave is normal in size and shape and QT interval is normal. Yep. So this patient is having atrial fibrillation. Okay, all right. Yeah. All right. So thank you, Dr. Padma. You did okay. really good. Your history was really, really good given that you just started our course. So yeah. you, you did all the good part, like asking the history was really great. And I know that you get confused with the ECG. Just go through this ECG again, like SVT, atrial fibrillation, atrial flutter, prolonged QT syndrome, myocardial infarction, and pericarditis. This is, these are the six ECG that you need to know. All so right. 
and just go with that have a look in multiple ecg on the google and then you will find it very easy okay, okay? thank you Dr. all right thank you so let me explain that what uh, what we can add in here so the history was pretty good i would say most of the differential diagnosis you have asked so in here you one of the important thing guys for all of you if you look at here vital signs is stable most of the time because this is an online exam now they will give that vitals before because they know that you are going to ask it and that's a confusing part in the online exam so have a look at the vital signs most of the time they will give you that is it stable or they would give you the absolute value of the vitals in the question if it is given in the question you should not ask it again so that's very really important because at that time examiner will think that this this examinee is not reading the stem properly okay so that's very really important if it is given in the stem don't ask it again many examiner they say can you please read the stem again so when it, when invigilator or examiner says something like that you will be very very confused and you will lose your confidence so just to avoid that sort of situation have a look at what is the vitals before you ask it so that part i wanted to discuss then start with the palpitation question as you did you did really good question asking so what exactly happened today all these questions that we discussed and after that associated symptom you asked that's good all other differential diagnoses including cns cvs you ask about all the endocrine causes like thyroid pheochromocytoma you ask about hypoglycemia you rule out infection you can rule out electrolyte imbalance also so any recent vomiting or diarrhea you ruled out anemia that's good and menopause you asked that was really great stress you asked so you did a really good history in here then you ask about coffee tea smoking alcohol you can ask about recreational drugs also and past medical history also you asked so that's good pfe card from examiner so mainly i haven't actually provided it to you most in the exam they will they will share it in the screen and you will just go through the pef you don't need to explain it to the examiner or patient unless it is asked in the task okay many of you have asked me that do we need to explain pef to the patient you don't need to do that unless it is given that explain pef with the examiner or with the patient get investigation from the examiner so very important is asking about the ecg comment on ecg to the examiner so you have to explain ecg to the examiner then explain what is your diagnosis try to give some of the differential as well even if it is not asked and implication implication of af is mainly two things one is a stroke another is heart failure as we discussed when you when you explain atrial fibrillation try to add that one of the important risk factor of having atrial fibrillation is high blood pressure so it's very important that you take your medication appropriately and make sure that we control your blood pressure to prevent it further okay so because sometimes explain diagnosis with reason terms so at that time whatever reason you will get you have to just add it in here also excessive coffee can trigger it so you need to just add it that yes excessive excessive intake of coffee can be a triggering factor also you are having high blood pressure that can be a risk factor as well other risk factor you can also discuss this is a very long case as you can see your task is four or five i think history pfe card investigation comment on ecg five task so you have to be very quick okay even though you 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 miss some of the history don't bother with that very very first finish all this task all right any question from any of you
Yes, Dr. Devashish, we should ask all the cardiovascular question if PFE is a task. But if PFE card from examiner, then whatever is in the card, you don't need to ask anything extra. Yes, and Dr. Ruhi, implication means complication. Dr. Parla, they don't use generic name of medication. Uh, they don't use brand names. There is no need to think about that they're going to give you some medication that you haven't heard about. Only thing that I have seen one time that microgynon 30, that's the name of the oral contraceptive pill that can be given sometimes but all the medications will be in generic name. And if you are confused about any of the medication, like sometimes patient can give you medication list. If you are confused, you can always ask it to your invigilator or examiner. But don't get confused with generic name. If you're confused with brand name, then you can ask. That's fine. Great. Ventolin, we use Ventolin in, in here also, in Australia also. Ventolin has also other names. So like, yeah, like Ventolin is salbutamol. Most of whom, like in, in Australia, everyone knows it about like Ventolin or Asmol. So if it, if it is given as a Ventolin, just think about Salbutamol. All right, so we'll take a 10 minute break now and then we'll discuss some other role play. Dr. Visna, we'll start with you after, the role, uh, after this break. So please be here in 10 minutes. Thank you all. So we'll see you in 10 minutes.
All right, everyone. So let's just start again. So is Dr. Visna here? All right, I'm going to unmute you. Hello, Dr. Asha. Yes. Okay. I'm going to give. Oh, there is a sound. Better face now. Mm -hmm. I can't. Uh, there is a sound coming up. Second to close the window. Now, is it okay? I think so. Okay. Just let me know if you. Oh, you still need some sound. Mm, I don't know. Like, what kind of sound? Uh, I know you're kind of. Uh, uh, whenever I'm talking, like there is some. Yeah, it's kind of vibrational buzzing sound. Maybe the internet, I don't know. <clears throat> Uh, if it's really disturbing, maybe someone else to continue with the role play because it's like a free session today. Yeah. I don't want to disturb the role play today. Uh, yeah, that's fine. Sorry for that. I think I don't know like what's the sound is coming. Like whenever I'm talking, I think uh, there is a background noise coming out from you. Okay. Are you using any uh, microphone? I'm using uh, headphones. Should I remove them? Try, try that. See that what's happened. Let's see. Uh, have you done that? Uh, can you hear me now better? Yes, I can. Yes, now it's good. Okay, okay. maybe the problem was the, with the headphones. Yeah, yeah. Good. Okay, apologize for that. <clears throat> no, that's fine. Don't worry on that. Let me give you the keys. Okay. So this is your case, your one minute time just started. Okay. Hi, doctor. Can I take your ID? Yes. So this is the patient here, not the daughter. So the patient name is George. You can start. Okay. Um, hi, I'm Dr. Visna, one of the doctors here. And I'm the doctor who will look for your father now. Uh, how may I address you? 
Uh, my name is uh, Sara, doctor. Sara, okay. Uh, Sara, I understand that um, your father um, has uh, has recently fallen, and um, I would like uh, to know um, what he was doing at that time. Oh, doctor, he was just doing some gardening, and suddenly he just fell. I'm so sorry to hear that, but let me reassure you that your father is in very safe hands. And we will do our the best to help your father. And um, does he maybe complain of any dizziness or any blackouts before the fall? No, doctor. No? OK. And is this for the first time? No, this happened for, I think, the third time this happened here. Yeah. Oh, the third time. It uh, happened suddenly all the time? Yeah, the other two times he was just like getting up in the morning and mm -hmm. then just I, I heard it sound like a, like he just hit the head, I think, on the floor. Oh, he did? Okay. And how is he now with the head? He has any trouble with that? Mm, he's fine. There is no injury, I think. Uh, okay. And um, so uh, after the fall, uh, was your father able to stand up uh, himself? Yeah. Okay. Uh, that, uh, did he feel uh, drowsiness after that? Or mm, no. No. So, for how long it uh, took uh, to regain his consciousness? Basically, after he did not lose consciousness at any of this time. He mm -hmm. just okay. had a fall. Just yeah. a fall. Okay. Yeah. Um, so may I uh, ask you some questions regarding his father? Um, so uh, did he uh, complain before of some chest pain or shortness of breath or any racing of the heart? No. No? Okay, any previous history of stroke? No. Any dizziness when, she, when he uh, gets, up from, gets up in the morning from the bed? Yes, doctor. The other two times he had a fall just by getting up from the bed. Okay, so it's happening in the morning? Yeah. Okay. Um, any recent fever, vomiting, diarrhea, maybe? No. No. Does he feel tired or fatigued these days? Or is he on a special diet, maybe? No. No. And how about his general health? Any history of diabetes, hypertension, or heart disease? Yeah, he has diabetes and high blood pressure. Okay, for how long he is diabetic and uh, with hypertension? Uh, it's been a long time. Uh, I think it's been diagnosed about 10 years ago. Okay, does uh, he do his regular checkups with the specialist or with his GP? Yeah. Okay, um, so uh, is he on any medication for uh, this mentioned disease? So he takes metformin for diabetes, mm -hmm. and also he takes, uh, I think, one of the uh, one of the diuretics they say. Mm -hmm. Okay. And also he takes uh, remipril for remipril. high blood pressure. Okay, I see. Uh, any numbness or tingly sensation? Maybe he is complaining of that or unsteadiness in his legs, maybe? No. No? Okay. Have he is checking uh, a regular blood test with his GP? Yeah. Okay. Um, is he has any allergy of any medication or no. consuming some alcohol or smoking cigarettes? No. Okay. Um, does he have support at home? Or he is um, yeah. alone, alone uh, most of the time? Yeah, he lives alone at home. Okay. Uh, does the home have flags of lights or maybe handrails or maybe slippery carpets or stair lifts? Uh, no. I'll... No? Okay. Um, thank you so much, um, dear Sarah, for all the information that you gave to me. I, uh, so most probably of the um, uh, history, uh, so your uh, father has um, postural hypertension. Uh, so this is happening when he's getting up uh, from the bed 
and uh, because uh, of probably of the most medication is he's uh, taking. Um, so uh, this causing uh, this problem and um, as well uh, could be cardiovascular disease, but he doesn't have any rating of the heart or shortness of breath or chest pain could be uh, central nervous system problems, but he doesn't have any numbness. Uh, also could be anemia, but he's not on a special diet or he's not tired um, as well. Uh, so uh, could, the problem could be some, uh, uh, some uh, could be uh, so, uh, some, pro some problems in the, ho in the home, like carpets, slippery carpets or, lacking of handrails, but uh, your father is okay with that. So most probably he has postural hypotension. And uh, so I would like to, um, so refer your, the, your father uh, to the specialist. Uh, so he will be able to review his medication and adjust them according um, uh, his situation at the moment. Maybe the specialist will run some extra tests like uh, full blood examination, urea and creatinine, um, liver function tests, renal function tests. So uh, to exclude uh, other uh, causes of uh, this uh, condition. And um, also I will give you some reading materials which gonna give you yeah. some idea regarding this condition. Thank you, doctor. All right, uh, Dr. Vesna, you did really good. I would say that you're doing really good and you're asking most of the important questions. Now, mm -hmm. one thing is important that is that if your task is to just diagnosis and differential, don't bother with the management. So you just okay. don't need to talk about anything because most of the examiner will interrupt. Now in the online, they don't interrupt. so. It's better not to do anything which can make them like a little annoyed. So mm -hmm. because in the face-to-face -face exam, when when examiner used to interrupt the examinee, so that time usually if your task is just diagnosis and differential and you go for management, usually they would say, uh, they would interrupt you and they say that stick to your task. Okay. Okay. Yes. Now Next. they're not interrupting, but make sure that you don't go in anywhere apart from the task now what you can do you have is still time and explain the diagnosis because if you think this is a postural hypotension so what is postural hypotension and why this patient having postural hypotension that's that's the important thing so explain mm -hmm. the reason because one of your tasks is to like diagnosis and differential with reasons so that's these things this is a key step that are you talking about the reason? What is the reason of postural hypertension in this patient? Uh, probably the medication he is taking. Yeah, yeah, most likely it's the medication. Now, yeah. important thing is that this patient is taking metformin, which doesn't cause postural hypertension, but he's taking diuretics, he's taking ACE inhibitor, which is ramipril, and yeah, mainly these two, right? So. Yes. Both of these two medications are antihypertensive that can lower down the blood volume. And most of these patients can get postural hypertension for this medication. You should always ask that any of this medication has been recently introduced or any recent increase of the dose. Also, who takes care of the medication? Is the patient itself taking the medication or anyone else helping him to take the medication? So because that's needed to know that maybe this patient has been taking it for a long time. Why now this patient having this postural low blood pressure? So we need to find that out, right? So yes. apart from medication, what else can cause postural hypotension? So anyone having any recent vomiting, diarrhea, any, any infection can cause postural low blood pressure low. This patient having di diabetes, diabetic autoneuropathy can cause postural hypertension. So you have to introduce these things in your explanation. And then you go for all other differential. When you go for differential, don't say cardiovascular, central nervous system, talk about the diagnosis or disease. Say that it could be due to myocardial infarction or heart attack, but your father or your dad doesn't have 
any chest pain, shortness of breath. So in that way, okay, it could be stroke okay. or transient ischemic attack or mini stroke, but he doesn't have any weakness, any pro problem with vision or speech. Okay. Okay. So explain with the disease, not as a system. Yeah, I see. And try to, yeah, try to like, try to say a lot of, lot of differential because this mm -hmm. case is like full of differentials. So whatever you are asking, you ask most of the differential. So say all the differential and then just say that why it's not the case. Okay. okay. All right, you did good. And is there anything else I wanted to talk about? Inshallah. No, that's fine. And one thing, consent. You did not take consent, which means that you're talking with the daughter about the patient. You have to ask the daughter that do you have the mm -hmm. consent to talk about this, to, to, to talk about your father. Okay, that's a good point. Thank you, doctor. Yeah, no worries. And also, like, you can ask, like, Yes, Dr. Parla, so right. So you can rule out seizure also. So always follow that pre-syncope, syncope, post-syncope post in that way. Asking uh, ask in detail about the past two fall, that what exactly happened in those two falls. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you. All right. No worries. Thank you. Keep it up. You're doing really good. Thank you, Dr. Asha. I'm just muting you. Who wants to do the next role play? Dr. Sadaf? I'm unmuting you. Just let me know when you when you can hear. I have unmuted you. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, doctor. Yeah, I'm unmuted. All right. Yes, I can. I can hear you. So, if someone's video is on, I will just stop the video. All right, so let me give you the case. Just hang on a minute. So this is your case. And you are in the ED setting. Your one minute time has started. I can't hear you, Dr. Sadaf. Have you been unmuted? Uh, yeah, doctor, yeah, I can hear you. So your one minute time started. <clears throat> uh, I can think now, doctor, one minute, or I will start Sorry? now. Yeah, oh, you can take one minute, that's fine. Okay, please give me one minute.
Hi, uh, okay, so doctor. this is your patient. Your <clears throat> patient name is Jenny. You can start. Okay. Hi, Jenny. I am Dr. Sadhav, one of the tanning doctors here. I have come to know from your notes that you are suffering from chest pain. Uh, I'm really sorry to hear about that. Uh, may I know how are you feeling right now? Oh, yes, doctor. Still, I'm having this chest pain. Oh, I, I'm really very sorry to hear about that. But don't worry, you are here. We will try to comfort your symptoms and we will try to figure out what are causing these symptoms. Uh, may I know, uh, Jenny, what is your pain score right now? One uh, from uh, on the scale of one to 10 right now? It's uh, about five or six. Okay. So do, are you comfortable to give me further history or do you want me to arrange a painkiller for you? I'm okay, doctor. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, Jenny, I would like to speak to my examiner and I will come back to you in a moment. Is that okay with you? Yes. Thank you. Dear examiner, I want to know the vitals of my patient. Vitals are always stable. Okay, uh, thank you, doctor. Uh, I would proceed with the history further. Thank you, Johnny, uh, Jenny, for the waiting. And uh, um, I can see that as you are stable right now for the further history. So I would like to ask some questions from you. Uh, can you explain uh, exactly how this chest pain started? Yeah, it just started just suddenly when I wake up uh, in the morning. And since then, still I'm having this chest pain. Okay. So uh, can you uh, tell me where exactly is the pain right now? Uh, it's in my left side of the chest. Okay. And uh, do you feel like uh, it's a so crushing pain or it's so stabbing kind of pain? Can you explain the character for me? I don't know, doctor. It's just like in, in one location in my chest and it's really bothering me. And do you feel that there is any radiation of the pain anywhere else except the uh, chest side? What's radiation? Uh, like, uh, do you feel that pain is going anywhere else? In your arm, uh, in your jaw, think, anywhere? I think it's going a little bit in my back. I'm not sure about that. Okay. And uh, do you feel anything is relieving your pain or anything is uh, uh, increasing the pain? What do you mean? Like there is any relieving factors, like which what you do and uh, that makes your pain better? I don't know. I, I think I just sit. Okay. So sitting makes it better. Okay. Thank you. And uh, Jenny, uh, do, do you have any recent flu-like illness? Yes, I, uh, I had a flu like about a week ago. Okay. And um, uh, do you feel any racing of your heart and uh, you feel any difficulty in breathing? No. Okay. And, uh, and do you feel any blackouts or anything before this pain started? No. Uh, do you have any fever or cough? No. And recently, do you have any trauma to your chest? No. Okay. And uh, do you have any heartburn or any bitter taste in the mouth? No. Is your uh, chest is sore to your to the touch or is there any rash on your chest? No. Okay, so um, um, uh, Jenny, I would like to know that, do you uh, uh, worry a lot or an, an anxious person? No. Okay, uh, thank you, Jenny. And uh, I would also like to know, do you have any uh, past medical history of this heart disease or hypertension or blood sugar uh, diabetes? No. Okay. Do you have a family history of diabetes and heart disease? No. And do you drink uh, or smoke? No. Okay. Is currently you are on any medications? No. Okay. Uh, thank you, Jenny, for all your uh, answers. I would like to speak to my examiner and I will get back to you. Dear examiner, uh, I want to know about the vitals of my patients. Is that stable like before? Is it stable? Okay. And uh, I would like to know the general appearance of my patient, including paler or sinuses. 
Is there anything like All that? Physical examination is normal. Proceed to your next task. Okay, so uh, <clears throat> even the CVS examination is uh, like normal, doctor? Yes, is there any particular thing that you need to know from your CVS exam? Okay, is there any pericardial rub? There is some scratching sound on auscultation. Okay, doctor, thank you. And uh, is there any office test available? What are you looking for? Uh, I want to know about the ECG, blood sugar level, and urine, uh, urine dipstick test. Okay, so urine dipstick and BSL is normal. This is your ECG. Okay, thank you, doctor. I would uh, look into the ECG. Okay, thank you, doctor. Uh, um, this ECG, uh, okay, uh, thank you, Jenny. As per your history and all the physical examination, and uh, uh, I have uh, come to know that the probable diagnosis about uh, your condition, maybe it is a condition known as pericarditis. And uh, uh, do you know about it? No, doctor, what is that? Okay, uh, please uh, uh, just relax. I will explain it to you in detail. Pericarditis is actually a condition in which the outer layer of your heart, which is known as pericardium, it is get inflamed because of some infection where might be recently you have a viral uh, infection last week, as you told me. So probably this can be a reason. And because of that inflammation, uh, you can have this chest pain. And uh, this probably is a reason for your chest pain right now. And ECG is also showing, uh, which is uh, 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 as diagnostic for your pericarditis. So probably this is a condition and don't worry about mm -hmm. that. So, the, uh, so it can be uh, any other conditions, but as uh, I exclude the in history about others, like in uh, um, uh, aortic stenosis, mm -hmm. there should be some Okay, thank you, Doctor. All right, sorry to disturb. So, yes, Dr. Sadhav, it was really good. You did that very, very good history. You asked most of the important questions and your starting was really good. So keep it up. It was nice. And so 58-year-old having a chest pain. Now, one of the things that I wanted to say that anyone in this age group having a chest pain, think it as a myocardial infarction on this unless you can prove otherwise, okay? So when you, when you go for the vitals from the examiner and you know that this is a stubble, but it's still, I would suggest to ask, like to do those things, at least like if you don't want to start Mona now, that's fine, but at least you should do a ECG immediately. Okay, that means that uh, the same thing that because it's the ED, you can send the patient to the resuscitation cubicle, you can, ask the nurse to do the ECG, hook this patient to the ECG monitor and also take blood, send the blood for like mainly cardiac enzyme, including the troponin. And you can give morphine as a painkiller if needed. And now, if, if this patient having five or six pain, you don't need to give morphine, that's fine. So at least like do the ECG and send this patient to the recess cubicle. That should be a good idea to do be, given the age of this patient is 58, okay? So do that in all the cases. It's really a good practice to do. Then in the chest pain, you actually ask all the question. There is nothing to add in the history. PEFE, it's now most of the time, this will be a like PEFE on card. So sometimes patient can say that, uh, like examiner can say that everything is normal. Then if, if, if examiners say everything is normal, then don't bother. Now, yes, I know that sometimes you can get pericardial rub in pericarditis. Most of the time in the card, they will write it as a scratching sound or noise in the pericardium. So they might not use pericardial rub because it will give the diagnosis away. So they, they, they can use those sort of word. Now, one of the thing I wanted to say, what was that thing? I totally forgot. Uh, I just remembered now. Oh. 
Okay, I forgot, I don't know why. <laughs> now, investigation from examiner, you asked like ECG, you did good that if in the task, they don't say that explain ECG to the examiner, you don't necessarily need to do that. So if you're running out of time, don't bother with explaining ECG to the examiner if it is not your task. Diagnosis, differential diagnosis. So give like very, very fast, say it is acute pericarditis, explain what is pericardium and why this pericarditis happens and give all of the differential. Reassure heart that this is not a heart attack given the ECG. Okay. Oh, I remember now. In the history, uh, the, the role player was a little rude with you. Now, many of these patients can be rude with you. Okay. One of the things that they can say, because they want you to confuse the short of cages, so they can be a little complicated. They might not give you everything that you ask. Like you are asking open-ended question, Many of the role players should give you the information, but some of the role players are designed not to give you a specific thing so that you, like, you need to do a hard work to get to the diagnosis. Like when you said anything makes you better or worse, I say that, what do you mean? If sometimes they say this sort of word, that what do you mean? Like, I obviously know what does it mean, but still I'm asking, what do you mean? That means I want you to ask a specific question, which means that I want you to ask that, does your pain get better with sitting forward and does it get worse with lying down? So that means that I'm asking you to ask me. Okay, so remember these sort of tricks. This will really help in the exam. Sometimes like the, because if I give you this information, you already know the case. So I will be a little tricky not to give you this information. But if you ask me the definite question, I have to give you that, right? So. This, is, this works in this way in many of the history. Other than this, this case is straightforward. So you did good. So is that for every chest pain case? Any question? For every chest pain case, we would send the patient to the resuscitation cubicle if the age is like more than 40, I would say, yeah. This is high risk group. So if you don't have time for differentials, then at least say, like, don't bother with the explanation, just say at least five or six differentials so that the examiner can at least mark you. That's totally fine, Dr. Sadaf, because in here, what will happen? PFE will be on card. So you will get a lot of time. Now see this thing that this, this case was not very long because the history is a little long, I know. PFE will be on card, so you'll not waste a lot of time in PFE. Investigation from examiner, just you just need to have a look on the ECG, not even explaining it to the examiner. So you'll get some time on that time, on that part. And diagnosis differential. So the thing is like in the history, you have to cut it out. So sometimes just, just, just move forward. Don't bother with the like psychological questions. So cut short, like you have to finish these sort of cases. Chest pain history is really, really long because there is a lot of differential diagnosis. So if you meet some of those, that will not like fail you. You have to finish this case. And remember one thing, in the exam, most of you who, who did frequent role play, like regular role play with the partner, you will be able to finish it in the exam. The exam is totally different. During the, during the role play with me or any of your partner, you will feel that like even before, the, like seven days before your exam, you might run out of time. But in the exam, I don't know, like if you are going to pass, you will finish it in time.
Okay. So we have got one more role play to do. Who wants to do the last one? Dr. Parla? Okay. Just have a second. Dr. Asma, I'm really sorry. I might not be able to do role play with you today, but please make sure that you tell me that you asked today in our next role play session so that I can start with you first. Dr. Parla, can you hear me? Yes, doctor, can you hear me? Yes, I can. All right. Give me one minute and I will give you the case. Okay, thank you. can't find any good case for you, Dr. Parma, because most of the important cases has been already done. Do you want to do something, some new case? Sorry? Are you all right to do a new case? What do you mean like new? Something new, which, which we might not discuss in the class. Uh, I can try if you want. Let me see if I can find any of the good one. All right, there is a case which we can do. So there is a case with hypertension non-compliance, which we don't do with the cardiovascular system, which we do with the psychiatry apparently, because the case is associated with dementia. So now we're not doing that today. We'll do it with the neurology, with the psychiatry, but Okay, let's do this one. Now, this is a little bit of new thing, but you know everything. So just give it a try. Okay. Now you can ask a little bit of history also. So that should be fine. Okay.
All right, so hi, doctor. This is your patient. Your patient name is Mary. You can start. Okay, hi, Mary. I'm Dr. Perla. How are you feeling today? Yeah, I'm, I'm okay, doctor. Thank you. Well, I've heard, Mary, that um, you had some heart racing because you had high blood pressure, and then you came to the hospital today, and an ECG was done, which is an electrocardiogram, yeah, yeah. and this showed that you have a condition called atrial fibrillation. Now, don't worry. Oh, I didn't know yes. that. Yes, this condition, um, I will explain it to you in just a second. I just wanted to let you know that you're okay, you're in a safe place now, and we're going to do everything we can to make it better for you. Now, just a couple of questions, if that's okay. Um, how long have you had high blood pressure for? It's been years, doctor, like about five years. Okay, and have you been taking your medications regularly? Yeah, sometimes what happens, like I, I feel like my blood pressure is totally fine, so I don't take it regularly. Oh, okay. Um, so what medications do you usually take? Um, it's, it's called amlodipine, I think. Mm -hmm. Anything else? No. Okay. No other medications, no other medical conditions? No, doctor. Okay. So what atrial fibrillation is, it's an abnormal rhythm in your heart. So what happens is your heart has usually electrical activity. And if it's abnormal, it, then you will have an abnormal rhythm. So it will be faster than usual. And that's why you felt that your heart was racing. And what happens is when your heart, when your heart's rhythm is irregular like this, like this, and you have racing of your heart, um, it might be caused by different, different causes for your condition. Um, in this case, it's because you have high blood pressure, which was not controlled because you are not taking your medications regularly. So this might be a cause, but there are other causes for this, such as um, an abnormal heart condition, or if you had a previous heart attack, or um, a heart abnormality that you were born with, or maybe your, your thyroid gland was being overactive, or maybe you were having too much coffee or alcohol or smoking too much. It could also be due to a lung disease like for example if you had asthma um, it could be due to a viral infection or a previous surgery or maybe it was just um, ha having stress or anxiety or maybe a panic attack so um, don't you worry we will manage you and we will treat you in the best way we can so the next steps that I want you to, to know of is that first of all um, this is a heart condition but it is treatable so we will be referring you to a cardiologist, which is a heart specialist, and he will be able to monitor your condition better. But usually what happens with atrial fibrillation, the treatment would be um, to put you on regular medications um, that will regulate this irregular rhythm that you had. Um, but the problem is that you need to comply with your medication. So we cannot skip a dose if we're feeling better, like when you said your heart blood pressure was high, but sometimes if you feel okay, you don't take it. This is a lifelong treatment. So we need to put you on this treatment so we can prevent atrial fibrillation from happening and becoming worse with time. Are you understanding me, Mary? Yes, doctor. Okay. So mainly the medications that you're gonna take are similar to those that you take when you have high blood pressure. Like we can be taking um, something called a beta blocker um which slows down your heart rate because usually in atrial fibrillation your heart rate becomes very fast so to slow it down we can take that medication and we can also take a medication that regulates this rhythm so it's called an antiarrhythmic medication these medications will be further explained by your cardiologist when we refer you to him but if you have any questions in the meantime feel free to ask me and if you feel any further symptoms that are quite bad, like um, 
you feel like you're going to faint or you have dizziness or any um, like red flag situation, please um, notify the emergency department and go straight away. Um, yep. Yeah. Otherwise, uh, if you take your medications regularly, hopefully you'll be okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, you still have one minute, 40 seconds. Do you want to add anything or you want to stop? Uh, well, honestly, doctor, I'm a bit nervous. <laughs> I'm not sure what to no, you're say. You're doing good. We're doing really, really good, all right? Given that we haven't done this one before, you explained like really nicely. No, all right, don't, bother, don't worry with this one. Let me just add one thing. So in atrial fibrillation, it's a 50 year old, this patient is a high risk to have a stroke. So we always try to prevent stroke or any thromboembolic event by doing this chest VUSC scoring, right? Now, oh, yes. Chest Chest versus scoring, mainly you need to ask some of the questions related to chest versus scoring. So if we go to the chest versus score, then the main thing that you already, already got hypertension in this patient. So this patient needs something to prevent thromboembolic event. Apart from your hypertension, what else we can ask to this patient is like, uh, in chest versus score, patients C for congestive heart failure. So mm -hmm. any history of any heart failure you can ask, but this patient will not have heart failure. So one of the chest first C for congestive heart failure, H for hypertension, which is score one. This patient is scoring at least one, I can see. A is more than 75, diabetes. Previous history of a stroke or TIA gets two point and any history of vascular disease. Sometimes A is between 65 to 74, also gets one point. And if it's a female, then gets one point. Sometimes, okay? Now, the main thing that if chest versus score is one or above one, that patient should be started with warfarin, okay? Nowadays, there is no, nothing like that. You, you will only give aspirin. Previously, there is like, if it is one, we can just give aspirin, no need of warfarin, but it's been changed recently. So only thing that you can give that if it's a score is zero, then no need of any anticoagulation. But if it is more than equal one, which this patient is scoring at least one. So this patient needs an anticoagulation, which should be warfarin. Now, given the acute state of this patient, warfarin will take some time to act, at least three to five days. So we will start both heparin and warfarin at the same time. Oh, yes. Yes, and, the, for the bridging then, to take effect. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So then we will monitor the INR. Once the INR becomes therapeutic, which means between two to three, then we will yes. stop the heparin and we will just continue with the warfarin. And this will be a lifelong warfarin for this patient. Okay, so okay. this short of, in this case, only thing that you missed is this part. Otherwise, everything is really good. You, you, you described very, very well. Another thing which would be a good idea to do is asking the vitals initially because this patient is diagnosed with atrial fibrillation. If it's unstable patient, we need to go for like DC cardioversion immediately. So it's very, yes. very important that we ask hemodynamic stability in these cases. So that because the management is totally different because or like depending on their stability, it will be totally different management. So it's very important yes. that we ask it. And okay. another thing I thought that because this is an ED setting, you should not refer this patient to a cardiologist. What you will say that most of the time you are a junior doctor like a HMO or RMO. So you will say that I'm going to admit you to the hospital for further management. I'm going to talk with my senior and also we will involve the cardiologist or heart specialist for your further management. Now the oh, cardiologist, okay. given your, your vitals are stable and cardiologist can try to control your rate by giving you some medications like beta blocker. 
or they can all or he can also go for controlling the rhythm by giving these antiarrhythmic drugs all these drugs and their side effects and everything will be discussed in detail by your by your heart specialist sometimes if none of this helps we might need to go for a dc cardio version just a synchronized shock to get back your heart in a normal regular rhythm please don't get stressed about that you should be fine with the medication so please don't worry we will discuss in detail if these things are needed another thing which is very important for you because atrial fibrillation makes your makes your heart to form clot in its upper chamber and that clot clot can dislodge and that can go to your brain and causing a stroke by blocking the blood pipes which can supply your brain and it can go to anywhere else in your body to cause this sort of complications now to prevent complications your heart specialist may also consider starting with blood thinners so most likely we will start you with heparin and warfarin at the same time we will regularly monitor your inr to see if your inr is in therapeutic range once it is in therapeutic range we will stop your heparin and then we will continue with warfarin now the heparin this is a blood thinners it's given as an injection subcutaneously which means under the skin and also the warfarin is usually given by mouth i understand this is a lot to take at this moment mary but these are all important things that we are doing for you and please don't get stressed you are in the safe hands and we have a very good team of cardiologists in here who will take care of you if you want me to call your partner or any friends or relatives i will be happy to do so okay so finish in lot of reassuring word as you did you did really good how you how you manage this cages dr parla examiner is going to love it okay so keep it up it's really really it's really good but try not to miss any of the key steps like in this case you you did all the key steps just only one key step will be this anticoagulation but you should be fine okay thank you doctor all right nice thank you yeah so complication of af can be added also so you can also discuss about that it can cause heart failure and also we have to discuss about this stroke as well okay so guys we did not discuss this case but just as you understand this is similar to the case af that we have done in here mainly you have to discuss what is atrial fibrillation just like we did draw a picture show that these are the electrical impulses that comes into your ecg and like your heart is not pumping regularly it's it's erratic or chaotic rhythm in here so heart is not getting enough time to pump blood okay and sometimes you can also feel headache you can also feel dizziness or lightheadedness because your brain is not getting enough blood okay so discuss in in the way how we discussed the af and then you can also then you discuss all the causes just like we have, we have given you a note of all the risk factors of af discuss all of those making sure you mainly point out the hypertension just like dr parla did okay and talk about the complications after talking about the complication go for the management so management will be depending on what cardiologist want with her making sure patient is stable we will try to control the rate if it is high sometimes we can also control the rhythm by antiarrhythmic and the very very important is to talk about anticoagulations okay and then you you'll finish with reassurance sometimes you can also ask some of the question to the patient especially about the blood pressure medication so ask about like how long have you been uh, so when have you been diagnosed with high blood pressure what medications are you taking are you taking it regularly or not 
So all are important to know that what's the cause of AF in this patient. Now, sometimes in here, you need to also do some blood test. So in your management, add some blood test as well, because this patient will need just a basic blood, like full blood examination, kidney function, liver function. Also, 50-year-old having a recent onset of AF can have an underlying ischemic heart disease or even a MI. So also do a cardiac enzymes, including troponin, Okay, and very important is to also talk about echocardiogram. A specialist can do an echocardiogram to see the heart function. Okay, and they can also consider doing a neck ultrasound just to rule out any carotid artery stenosis or any emboli in that area. Not very important to do the ultrasonogram of the carotid arteries, but important to do the echocardiogram. Any question, guys, in this case? Now, echocardiogram, you, it can help us to see if there is any vegetations, but mainly the sort of patient can have reduced heart function, like ejection fraction can be low. So we need to also see that what is the ejection fraction. And also we can have a look that if there is any clot or vegetations in the heart. So investigation in this case should be just a basic blood first. So full blood examination, kidney function, liver function, ECG already been done. So you don't need to do that. Cardiac enzymes, including the troponin. Now in here, you can also order blood sugar, thyroid functions because hyperthyroidism is a cause of AF. So you can do a thyroid function test. You can do also lipid profile just these are basic for anyone having any heart condition then obviously you should talk about echocardiogram of the heart that's usually will be done by the specialist but you should talk about it cool so any question we are going to finish our today's session now if you guys don't have any question those who are in the Facebook, any questions you are having? Dr. Gina, so I think I missed your previous question. So here we give differentials of AF or give differential diagnosis means causes of AF. So if it's a palpitation case and you diagnose the patient with AF, then you can, you can say that most likely the diagnosis is AF. What are the underlying causes you can say? If anything left, then you can put it in your differential diagnosis. Okay, because most of these are all interconnected. So you can give the causes of AF, like what are the causes? Ischemic heart disease, valvular heart disease, congenital heart disease then thyroid problem. So you can give the causes in that way. If anything left out from your differential of palp palpitation, you can just add it at the last. Dr. Umara, very, very good question. Will we be starting warfarin or say that cardiologist will start? Now, it's, it's not mandatory that you are going to start it. You can always involve your, card involve your senior or cardiologist also. Also, why not NOAC? Now, newer anticoagulants, still I will believe that for AF, we go for warfarin according to the TETS VASC scoring. Some of the cases we give NOAC, especially if it's a uh, deep vein thrombosis. Usually in those cases, we can give NOAC, but still for AF, 
it's preferred to start warfarin. If someone having complications or any chances of bleeding, then we can try NOAC in AF patient. But initially, it's better to start with warfarin. But again, you can always keep every option towards cardiologists. Whatever they want, they can start. Dr. Taiba, pre-operative cessation of warfarin is a long discussion. We discuss it in our course, so hopefully uh, we'll be fine with that. But it's a long thing to discuss. We'll not discuss it today, but anytime if we, if we are free enough, then we can discuss. Okay. Dr. Parla, why you need discussion of management of AP again? No need of, like, no, there will be no further discussion, but the, disc the management is pretty same. If someone is stable with AF, you do these sort of things. Yes, this is enough. Like, you need to explain what is AF. You need to explain the causes of AF, complication of AF, okay? and then do some investigation, involve the cardiologist and your senior, talk about the rate control, rhythm control, and anticoagulation, and that's it. So what I have just done, just all of you, this is how you remember your key steps. You don't memorize any notes, you don't memorize anything actually, apart from your differential diagnosis and format. We are doing cluster, you just remember the cluster format. You don't memorize management because this is a very, very hard thing to do and it will not help you. You just memorize the step or the key step that you're going to discuss. So that's how you, you will use your own words and that will sound great. Okay, so try to do that. Yes, warfarin is usually given in the valvular heart disease. That's the absolute indication of that. So you can always explain that according to the cardiologist, we can start with the heparin warfarin or if they want, we can also start with the newer anticoagulants. So you can always give options in that way. In that way, like everything, every option will be in the hand. It's case by case that starting warfarin, heparin, or NOAC, it's totally case by case. We, we see the risk and benefit, like for a 50 year old patient, bleeding in the brain is not that high in compared to someone as a 60 or 70 year old. For a 70 year old, you will not start warfarin because possibly he will die of bleeding in the brain. Okay, so this was our cardiology class. I think like this is all that you need. But always we, we upload all the questions or sample questions that is important for your exam in relationship to the cluster in our software. Once you join the course, you will get to be in the software and you will get all these questions. Make sure you do the role play based on those questions. Okay, and we'll see you in our next class. So still we have got few free role, uh, free classes. If any of you are interested in joining the five months course, please make sure you email us to the email given to your Facebook group or try to message us, say that you want to join so that we can start the process. All right. So it was really good to see all of you here. Thank you all. Have a great night. Bye.